2020? Oh, we're not talking about him today. Okay, doctor, how yes. how is it now? Much better. Can you hear uh, me? I got you. Good. Excellent. So nice to see you. Likewise. And and thank you, thank you, thank you so much for rescheduling. I really apologize again for the inconvenience of having to do this last week. You know, I tell you, surgery is like, they, like Forrest Gump. It's like a box of chocolates. You don't know what you're going to get. And every now and Absolutely. then, Friday's not my day. I was supposed to be relaxing. I had plans on talking to you all, you know, last week, Friday. And then sure enough, they called me up. There was a patient in the emergency department that I had to go take care of. So it happens every now and then. But you know what? You're a doctor. So, you know, if you got to be called in, that's what you got to do. So I understood. But thank you for joining us today. Uh, first off, I just want to say thank you so much for being dedicated to medicine and just serving the community. Thank so you. you're welcome. Appreciate that. And it, thank you. You're welcome. Um, hopefully I can pronounce this correct because I don't know why it was so hard for me to pronounce bariatric. You said it right. Bariatric surgery, <laughs> yep. I was literally... Uh, writing it out as Barry at Trick. Yeah, I like I, too. sometimes I gotta write it out too to make sure I don't mess it up too. That's okay. <laughs> and I love saying your name because I pretend like I know French. I'm like Fritz John. No, wait. Yep, Jean-Pierre. Fritz John Pierre. Yes. I, yeah, it. I feel so fancy saying that. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to easy to remember, hard to forget. That's what I always say. Absolutely. So if you could just start off by telling people a little bit about what you do sure. as a bariatric doctor. Sure. So, um, you know, really, I got into this field because of um, my interest in surgery. I always knew I wanted to be a surgeon of some kind, but specifically taking care of folks who struggle with obesity is something that really um, I found interesting, that, it, that we're sort of the underserved um, population of, of the world. I think people who struggle with their weight. And, you know, it's a much different relationship with a bariatric surgeon compared to just like a regular general surgeon who's taking out your appendix, right? If you if you get appendicitis, it hurts, you know, you got to go to the emergency department, that guy's going to show up, you may not have had a chance to get to know him, he's going to take out your appendix and he's going to like, see you later, good luck. Mm -hmm. With me, I really like is that um, I get to know my patients a little bit longer because it's a long process to get them ready. I want to make sure they have all the tools to be successful. Um, So... When I was in my surgery training, I was trying to figure out, you know, I wanted to figure out what's the, the, the right field for me. And mm-hmm. I ended up doing a fellowship in bariatric surgery. Um, it's called minimally invasive surgery, really. Uh, all kinds of kind of surgery you could do through laparoscopic or robotic approaches. And for me, I just love this, this, these patients. You know, they work hard. They're, they're hardworking. They, they love what their, their the success is amazing. When you see folks losing hundreds of pounds, uh, getting healthier, it just is a really rewarding uh, field of medicine to practice. That is so awesome. I love to see people passionate about what they do because yeah. uh, that makes the best doctors. But I guess most doctors are passionate because you guys go to school for so long. You do. <laughs> I say MD, all them degrees on the wall. Right. <laughs> major debt. That's what they stand for. Right. Look, <laughs> anybody who go to school for that long got to love what they're doing. Yeah. Thank yeah you. I, got, I got a lot of student loans to pay off. So. But we appreciate you, brother. Um, one thing I want to jump right into because I know a lot of people who deal with this is obesity. Yeah. Um, how do you um, think obesity particularly affects the black community? So the reality is that obesity is a problem for all races, but unfortunately for African Americans or black folks, we, we tend to struggle and have a higher rate of obesity um, than the rest of the population. And it helps to define what obesity is because that's part of the issue. You know, I always hear my, my sister girls come into the clinic and they, Doc, I don't want to get skinny. I just want to, you know, I want to maintain my curves. I still want to be sexy. Um, you know, but there's different ways that you can define a person's weight and, and determine whether or not they're struggling from obesity or they're having what's called morbid obesity. That's when it starts affecting their health. Mm-hmm. So for a lot of people who have um, about 80 to 100 pounds over what they're supposed to be, that's considered the ideal body weight that's when you start to see what we consider morbid obesity and they start struggling with issues of high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, uh, sleep apnea. A lot of women who are, are interested in, in uh, starting a family and they're having trouble with conception. They don't recognize a lot of times their obesity might make, might make it even more difficult for them to conceive. So there's so many different um, health conditions that, is, that are related to specifically the extra weight that you're carrying. So for me, the first discussion I have, or the first way I just define obesity is as I make sure people understand that it's basically any weight over that healthy weight 
that starts to affect your 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 health conditions, that's mm-hmm. when we need to do something about it. Now, you made some good points. Uh, you made some good points. You made some good points. Not to yes, cut ma'am. you off there, and I love the fact that you said the sisters they come in and they say they want to stay a little thick because right. as as we know in the black community. Uh, we're told that the men like for the black women to have a little meat on the bones. Sure. But, you know, when it gets too much, then we get a little worried about that. Because right. as we know, the black community, especially, we love to season our food. You know, we love soul food. And it's right. not particularly the most healthy uh, its choice for us. Right. So, I think, could you expound a little bit about BMI and yeah. um, when that's not healthy for you? Sure. So a BMI is an old, old fashioned scale. It came up in the 60s, basically, from insurance companies. Insurance companies would look at folks and they'd say, gosh, you know, if your BMI was this high, they, the insurance companies knew that they would have to um, uh, potentially have to deal with more health issues. You would have to pay for the medications. There's a higher risk for morbidity or death. So they came up with this scale that sort of defines what we consider our ideal body weight. And basically, any weight with a B, any BMI less than 25 is considered you know, ideal weight. Mm -hmm. Um, They determine that based on your height uh, and your weight, right? So if you're a woman five foot four, I guess I never remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I think it's like, let's say you're supposed to be about 160 pounds. If you weigh 190 pounds, you have potentially a BMI of, let's say about 29, 28. You're in that overweight category. You're getting closer and closer. When you get to a BMI of 30, that's when you're officially considered being uh, in that category of obesity. Um, and again, it, it may not be affecting your health. You know, there are a lot of folks who say, I go to the doctor and I get my blood work checked and they say everything is great. I'm a healthy fat person. Um, I say, <laughs> Wait, so is, that, is that actually true? Because I do hear people and I'm like, come on, guys. Is yeah. that true? Yeah, I say so far or you, you're not sick yet. Um, you can't stay. Uh, well, let's put it this way. You don't see a lot of overweight or obese. 80 year olds, you know what I'm saying? Okay. It definitely shortens your lifespan because it has so many different consequences on your joints, on your organs, uh, on your uh, happiness. A lot of patients struggle with that as well. So it's not just the health issues, but it's also the emotional issues that go along mm-hmm. with carrying that extra weight. And, you know, going back to the, the, the whole discussion about how in, our, in, in the black community, so a lot of times we see that little extra weight as a good thing. I always right. joke and I ask my patients, I say, so if he likes all that junk in the trunk, is he going to pay for your diabetes medication? Is he going to pay for your high blood pressure medication? Absolutely. Is he going to be there to help you out when, you know, if you're, if you're, God forbid, having some major cancers or something, as a result of all that extra weight. So it's not, you know, you can't look at it as just little thick thighs. You're, you have diabetes in those thighs, you know. You got nice weights. Well, guess what? You got a little, you know, high blood pressure in that weight, too. So you got to look at all those different things um, and determine if, if that extra weight is really worth it to you. Okay, so... Another thing that we get targeted with is saying that, you know, a lot of us don't like to exercise. Before a person, well, when a person is talking to you, before you want to take them to the point of surgery, sure. Uh, do you have like a nutrition plan or an exercise program that you may put them through first prior yes. to surgery? It's, it's mandatory, at least in my program. Okay. So I'm a big, okay. a big proponent of that because there's no magic bullet. You know, I, I hear a lot of patients who you may even see uh, some of these reality TV shows, folks who go out and get these surgeries, they lose weight initially pretty well, and then they start putting that weight right back on. It's more about the lifestyle change. So what I try to do is take folks who are from that unhealthy you know, lifestyle and put them in, in a healthier position. So yes, it can be as basic as just learning how to eat, how to exercise, basic stuff. So we have a registered dietitian here in our office. We have an exercise physiologist. We have a little gym you know, with exercise equipment, um, so we can show you how to work out. Um, we're not into, you know, personal trainings per se, but it's just a question of showing you the safe way to, to work out. Because some people struggle with other issues. So if you've been obese for a long period of time, you may not be able to do the, you know, I'm not expecting you to go out and do CrossFit tomorrow, mm-hmm. but start with a basic walking program. If you can make it from here to your mailbox and back, you know, for the first time today, great. Tomorrow, take it a little, you know, 100, 100 steps further and come back, you know, so you can continue to increase your exercise endurance. But exercise does um, a couple of different things for us. Yes, you're actually burning calories, which is important to help reduce that fat load on your body, but it also is building you muscle. That's the part where people seem to forget is that you need muscle to help your metabolism run efficiently. 
Well, somebody's asking me right before I go to my next question, does genetics play a part in weight gain? I think that's a great question. Yeah, it is. It does. I mean, there's so many different factors that come into weight gain. The most common ones, yes, are going to be the foods that we're eating, the exercise that we are or are not doing, right? But yes, if you have certain medical conditions, a lot of people who struggle with thyroid disease, for example, they tend me. to... Yeah, right. very common. Um, some people who have arthritis and have to go on steroids, so certain medications can cause weight gain. But genetics is definitely a component of it, uh, a component of your, your potential to become obese. Doesn't mean that you absolutely are going to have to be obese. If mom, dad was obese, doesn't mean you absolutely are going to have it. And we see that a lot of times. Families where everybody's thin and there's that one big person, or the other way around, everybody's big and they got that one skinny, you know, uh, sister, like, right. under the red hey, no. Water. Like little skinny mini over there thinking she got it all. But the reality <laughs> is that we know that the genetics and your environment are a big part of why you can gain weight. So it's not just your genetics. You also uh, inherit the taste buds. You inherit the way you cook. So like mm. you said, soul food, for example, if you like certain kinds of food, it's probably because you learned it in your household. Mom, mama cooked it. Big mama cooked it. Next thing you know, you're eating the same kinds of foods. So that's also um, the, the influence of your genetics and your, um, your, your lifestyle and your family in your potential to gain weight. And that is, I'm glad you hit on that point because a lot of people, we have oral traditions and growing up in a black household, especially, and I'm sure this for every type of family, we teach each other these secret recipes. And a lot of times those recipes aren't healthy. So I'm glad that you hit on that. We have to learn how to change our habits, start right. researching, you know, new things, start shopping other places. Yeah. And a better job of looking at the labels when you go to the grocery store. Right. So it's like at the shopping. Don't just go in there picking things. You got to be thinking about what you're grabbing. And you know what? One of the big issues when it comes to healthcare disparity um, is also the socioeconomic of, you know, of reality of where black folks live. There's this whole concept of what's called the food desert. You know, where mm -hmm. I was in Chicago, where I did my training, I'll never forget. I used to wake up and first thing in the morning, I see the kids waiting for the school bus. And they'd run into the corner store, grab themselves a bag of chips, those little jug juices. I don't know if they sell them anymore. Oh, you know, my <laughs> God. Yes, <laughs> There's yes. There's no juice in that jug juice. You know what I mean? It's not much sugar and water. So the reality is that was their breakfast, a bag of chips and, a, and, and straight sugar water because they didn't have access to healthier options. Nowadays, we're getting a little bit better, but now it becomes an issue of cost and finances. Can people afford to be able to – go to your you know your farmer's market and get fresh fruit fresh vegetables as opposed to going to a corner store or something like that and getting a, a quick and easy snack getting fast food there's fast food restaurants in every black rest in every black neighborhood but you don't see too many fresh uh fresh prepared restaurants in those same areas so that's another big big uh factor when it comes into why black folks are struggling with their weight so much now i heard you say a lot about behavior so I know a lot of times it's this concept or this uh, word called hangry. We get mm -hmm. angry when we're hungry. So I'm right. sure you probably got a lot of pushback from pa patients saying, well, I did do your, your nutrition plan, but I'm just hungry, doctor. Yeah. Is it important to uh, maybe see therapists when you're going through this new, when you're starting to think about having surgery, when you're starting a new um, health plan? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a couple of different answers to your question there. The first one is, yes, we know that we all have relationships with food. Some mm -hmm. people eat when they're sad. Some people eat when they're happy. Some people eat when they're bored. You know, whatever that relationship is, it definitely is going to affect your ability to lose weight or how your behaviors are. If you're in a very stressful job and you're, you've had a long day, you're not going to want to go home and defrost some food and try, hey, I'm going to stop at the you know, fast food restaurant and grab something on the way home. It's easier. So a lot of what we do, again, is, is about psychologically preparing you for all the lifestyle changes that are going to be required to be successful. I'm a big fan of, you know, taking my stuff out on the weekend because that's usually when I'm home. I'll grill mm -hmm. out 10 pieces of chicken because I know that I'll have something for you. It may not be a lot of variety, but at least I know I have grilled chicken for this whole week. Next week, we'll do all grilled fish or something like that so that I know I have a good option as opposed to me coming home at 6 o'clock at night. I'm hungry. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to feed myself and the kids. It makes it a lot more challenging when you're going on the fly. So I always say that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. You know, you know so, what that reminds me of? It reminds mm -hmm. me of simple things we're taught as children because we want to get up and just get ready. Like I was lazy and I would just get up and want to put my clothes on, don't even iron. But what would our mother and father tell us? Right. Get your clothes out at night. The night before. Iron, iron your clothes. <laughs> exactly. 
And that's the same way we have to treat nutrition in our food. Right. Write out a list. Exactly. Research those ingredients. Yeah. Get serious about where we're putting inside our bodies. Exactly. Exactly. Because yeah, even you... if it's just for um, us to feel full, it's for us to live. And sometimes we just eat just to eat. We're not thinking about what our body is truly truly is is a machine, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, an example I give my patients all the time, I say that. I'm like, you're like a car. Right now, you're an old beat up, you know, uh, hoopty. If you're right. going to upgrade to a nice luxury car, you got to start putting premium gas in your car. You can't keep Absolutely. going to, to, you know, the corner store and getting the cheap gas, trying to save a few pennies, because the reality is that your car is not going to run as efficiently. So your body, our bodies, uh, the engine of our body is our metabolism. Our metabolism is, is very much dependent upon not only these different hormones, the, the, the effects of our environment, but it's also very much dependent upon the foods that we put in our body and, and the exercise you're doing as well. So that's why I say they, they, those two things are very important, food and exercise, because um, imagine if you were stuck on a deserted island. This is a great example I give all the time, too. If you're stuck on a deserted island, you haven't eaten. If you ever watch it like um, Naked and Afraid or Survivor reality TV shows, they start off all energetic day one, day two, they feel great. Day three, what are they doing? Sleeping under the palm tree. Not getting now. angry, getting hangry. hangry. Like you said, hangry. Right. Because right? their body's telling them, hey, you're not, you're not keeping up the same amount of calories that I'm used to seeing on a regular basis. What's going on? Are we dying? Are we stuck on this island for a long time? What's going on? So a lot of people can struggle when it comes to their diets for the same reason. So we start them off on a diet, and initially their metabolism will slow down, and they start giving them all those warning signs that they're dying on that deserted island. So I try to coach people through that part. I say, look, this is normal. That's the normal process of initially going on a diet. We have to find the right mechanisms to sort of ensure that your body responds appropriately by putting the right foods in your body and exercising. Because if you really were stuck on a deserted island, you wouldn't be eating grilled chicken and broccoli and no. you wouldn't be building new muscle exercising. Your body would be completely in a different state. So that's why we try to say if you pre prepare yourself with the right kinds of foods, you have the best opportunity to sort of convert your metabolism to something that's going to give you better weight loss results. Now, I'm glad you said that, but because before we get into your real expertise, the surgery part of the bariatric uh, medicine uh, field, um, I think you just kind of hit on it. I just want to hit on metabolism. Is there a way to speed that up? I guess it's better to have a, a, a I guess, I don't know how to say that correctly, but like a sped up metabolism. Yeah. A pulse to a slow one. So is there yeah. a way you can kind of get your metabolism to work a little better? Yeah. So for what the first problem is, is that when you once you get the weight, so we, we sort of skipped over what caused the obesity. Well, we talked a little bit about it. Yeah. The food deserts, the kind of food that we're eating, the exercise we are, are not doing all that in the genetics like your, your uh, you know, one of your um, folks asked about all that definitely plays into how you get to obesity. But now mm -hmm. you're there trying to get your body to respond to weight loss efforts does depend on your metabolism and what happens what a lot of studies have shown us is that once you become obese the fat cells themselves can affect your metabolism and it slows your metabolism so that's why i always tell patients that when you struggle with obesity it's a chronic disease it's not something we can fix overnight we have it's an and it is a disease that's the first part too a lot of people don't recognize that they think oh she's just lazy she's not exercising she's just eating wrong i have patients who are 300 pounds and they work out more than i do and they eat better than i do wow their metabolism is so slow and so messed up at that point, it, it, it won't allow them to lose weight the way someone who's maybe you know 10 or 15 pounds overweight can lose that 10 pounds easily. I have people 300 pounds, it's a real struggle for them to lose that weight sometimes because their metabolism is so altered. So yes, um, exercise, food, there's medications now that are on the market that can help with increasing your metabolism. The problem is a lot of the medications also have horrible side effects. So while your metabolism may be increased, it could also cause some, some heart issues. It can mm. cause, you know, um, uh, uh, sort of that anxiety feeling. So a lot, a lot of the earlier um, um, appetite suppressants and, and, and metabolic boosters were almost like amphetamines. People felt like they're on speed. You know, mm. like, Ooh, I feel great. I can't eat. I'm so spectacular. Like it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you still can't sleep. It's because you're ramped up to 100 because you're taking these drugs. So that's sort of the, you know, the the conundrum, you know, like you want to, you want to be able to increase the metabolism, but you don't want to give folks a whole lot of side effects or potentially put their, their increased blood pressure or increased heart rate at risk of them having a heart attack or stroke. I, well, you know what? And I feel bad because, and I want to, I want to point something out to people. It's very important when you know somebody that's obese and they're maybe going through this 
to be supportive. Because yes. I know even myself, you know, I have certain people in my family who may be overweight, and every now and then I may say, well, I just think you're lazy. or, And I guess sometimes that's not fair for me to do. Yeah. So, you know, I just want to remind people to just try to be as supportive as you can to those people who, who are obese. Because like the doctor said, sometimes it's, it's more than just them not trying to exercise. It could be that it's genetic, some of those issues. Uh, it's a disease. So I, I yeah. appreciate you hitting on that point. Uh, now, let's, let's get into when it's time to, you know, get into surgery options. Sure, sure. Get a little bit on that. Yeah, I see somebody asking about the gastric sleeve. That's, that's that's the new kid on the block. Everyone wants to know about the gastric sleeve operation. It's either the gastric sleeve or the vertical sleeve gastrectomy. Um, what I tell folks, it's like essentially um, taking a big jar. Imagine you got a big old jar, and then you take <coughs> it down to a little itty-bitty jar. So conceptually, everyone understands that you can't put as much food in your little jar that you used to, to put in your big jar, right? So okay. your portion sizes are going to be a lot smaller um, after a sleeve, just because we're taking about 80% of your stomach out. We're reshaping the stomach into a, the, the shape of like a shirt sleeve. I mean, they could have mm -hmm. called this the banana or the tube gastrectomy, because that's what it looks like. The gastrectomy part means removal of the stomach. The sleeve just describes the shape of it. So for a lot of people, this is a great, great choice because it's not as invasive, so to speak, as some of the other weight loss operations where we're rerouting a lot of your plumbing, I'd say, you know, your intestinal um, tract is not completely rerouted. We're just reshaping the stomach. So you get a lot of the benefit of the hormonal changes. You have a smaller stomach. You feel less hunger throughout the day. And that can lead to pretty good weight loss. But mm -hmm. I always tell patients, you got to be careful. It's not a one-size-fits-all. There are some people who have really, really uh, severe metabolic disease that the sleeve may not be strong enough for them. They need a, you know, a better upgrade of their car. You know, you went from a Hootie to like a Toyota. Toyota Corolla. It's a good car, you know, get you where you need to go. But I'm trying to get you to that Lexus level. So if you really want to get to a Lexus, you got to maybe consider a little bit more aggressive operation choice. But the sleeve is a really, really good choice for a lot of people. You know, I say for patients who are about maybe 100, 125 pounds over their ideal body weight. So again, if you're supposed to be 140 pounds and you're maybe 250, 260, sleeve is a great choice. But if you're a 300, 400 pounder, we, we need to do a little bit more than just a sleeve sometimes for those kind of patients. Uh, someone is asking, is it reversible, and is the body able to get enough nutrition? It's not reversible. Um, you are able to get enough nutrition because of if you follow specifically the, the diet plans that most bariatric practices will set up for you as far as eating high-protein diets, cutting back on the carbs and, you know, the high fats. But most um, practices, including myself, we, we always recommend that patients take supplements. Okay. You can, you can you know, try to eat – all the salad you want to, but if you got a little tiny stomach, you can't, you know, you can't get that much into the little tiny stomach. So at the end of the day, you're still going to have to take some supplements to usually give you uh, what's your body's uh, deficient in. Okay, I had it written down here, but what's another um, surgery that you could also also be an option for a patient? Yeah, so the other one that's a really common one that's been around for a long time is the gastric bypass. Okay. So that one has a bunch of different names, too. It's called the Ruin Y, the R and Y, gastric bypass. That one has been around, you know, for years. Mm -hmm. So if you think of, like, Al Roker, the guy from, you know, uh, NBC Oh, News, yeah. He the weatherman. He's yeah, the weatherman. Yeah, Al Roker. He's had the gastric bypass. Um, that's a great, great operation because, yes, you also get a smaller stomach. You get a lot of improvement in those hormones, again, that are making your metabolism abnormal. But in addition, we also – now go down and change how your body absorbs food, okay? Mm -hmm. So normally you have your entire um, digestive system working to absorb whatever it is you've eaten. So if you have a burger and fries, every bite you take, you're going to get 100% of the carbs, 100% of the cholesterol, 100% of the fat in that meal. You get every little bit of it. With a gastric bypass, we move the connections downstream so that basically we're bypassing part of your stomach and we're also bypassing part of your small intestine. So basically that same burger with your little tiny jar now that you have your little tiny stomach, you can't eat nearly as much of that burger, but whatever you do eat with each bite, it's going to go a little bit further before you start breaking it down. So you end up only absorbing, let's say, 75% of the, of the carbs, 75% of the cholesterol. You get a little bit less with each bite, and that's why that one's a really good weight loss operation. It works phenomenally with diabetics. So for people who have diabetes and they're talking to their primary care doctor and the doctor is saying, hey, we're going to have to start you on insulin or we're on two or three different medications already. 
those are the kind of patients sometimes, even if they're only 100 pounds overweight, I may recommend mm -hmm. a gastric bypass over the gastric sleeve because it does a little bit better job at treating their diabetes. Now, after the surgery, am I just healed? Like, no. is my health just immediately better? Like, what's the recovery period and like, and when yes. do I start getting better? Great question. So we do, we do surgery almost outpatient. We call it a 23 hour observation. We keep you overnight just so I can take a look at you in the morning and you're all set and ready to go. But there are some centers now that are doing completely outpatient bariatric surgery, right? So most, and they're done through little tiny laparoscopic incisions. So it's called a minimally invasive surgery. We mm -hmm. go in with these little instruments and basically do the operation and you get to go home the next day with little tiny scars. Um, so the recovery period for most of my patients, they're back to work within a week or two. Um, oh, now, wow. you, yeah, it's not, it's not major, you know, it, it is major surgery, but it doesn't, it doesn't take a major toll on your body like it they used to do. Back in the old days, they would have to open you up, you know, like fillet you up like a fish, basically, in order to have <laughs> the same operation. So we don't do it that way anymore. Great, that's um, good. But there is a process of recovery still. You have to learn how to eat. So a lot of that happens before surgery, actually. I always try to enforce all that education before surgery, learning mm -hmm. how to eat, take your time, chew your food. And drink plenty of fluids, and, and after surgery, the process, you know, they'll lose weight. It takes them sometimes a year or two to get all the way down to the lowest weight. Now, there is one more surgery, if I'm, I think I'm speaking correctly, right? Yes. I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, the other one is an even stronger, bigger, this is about going up to like a Lamborghini. We passed Lexus, we're going all the way up to the... Okay. The, 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 right, right, we're going to the real, <laughs> real fancy cars. It's called the duodenal switch, or the DS. Yes, I haven't heard of that one. There, there is another one. There's also one called the lap band. Is that what you're thinking okay. about? Yes. Yeah. So the lap band is not as popular as it used to be. Um, that's when you put this rubber or, or um, you know, silicone band around the top of the stomach. And the whole idea was the band was supposed to slowly in, uh, restrict how much food you can eat. So you could look at some, a plate of food and say, ooh, I'm starving. I can't wait to eat. You take a bite or two, you're like, oh, I feel full. I can't eat anymore. But what we found is that a lot of patients learn to eat around the band, as we call it. So they would take, you know, really? take bites now, come back 10 minutes later, take a few more bites, and they'd still eat that whole plate of food. They just had to eat okay. it slower. Um, some people have problems with heartburn or reflux after their lap band. The band itself can move. It's like, it's like a belt, basically. If the belt goes up too high around your chest, you couldn't breathe, right? So that same thing can happen with the lap band, too. So nowadays, we see more people are getting the lap band removed. And they're mm -hmm. going to either that sleeve gastrectomy or the gastric bypass. It's not as common that folks, you know, are asking for the lap band. The other big part of it is that the weight loss is unpredictable. You know, I could do a, a, the same lap band operation on two sisters, twins, and they may not um, lose the same amount of weight. I'm like, okay, you grew up in the same household. You're genetically the same. You should, you know, you could weigh the same right before surgery, but one may do well and one may not. So that's the, the part that's a little frustrating is that we want something that's going to be a little bit more predictable, a little bit more reliable. And that's where the sleeve and the bypass tend to, to be um, more successful. So those are the two most common operations are the sleeve and the bypass. But the one I was talking about, the DS, the duodenal mm -hmm. switch, it's like a sleeve with a bypass. So it's even more aggressive. Um, those patients are usually, usually that's reserved for the, what we call super morbidly obese. Now their BMIs are not in the, just the 40s, they're in the BMIs in the 50, BMI in the 60. Um, those are folks who are sometimes four or 500 pounds, like those reality TV shows, 600 pound life. A lot of times they're doing that, um, that operation called the duodenal switch, and that one can give you great, great weight loss, but it also gives you more potential for vitamin problems, vitamin deficiencies, um, gives you more potential for bathroom problems. Mm -hmm. I always tell folks, you know, if you eat something you're not supposed to, I don't want you thinking about me while you're on the toilet, but you're going to remember I told you don't eat that because it'll have you run into the bathroom like, oh, my gosh, I shouldn't have eaten that, you know. So I sort of like that. It's like a nice little built-in deterrent to keep you away from those kind of foods. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely something you have to take into consideration. So that's why the sleeve and the bypass are the two most common right now. That's being performed all over the United States. The lap band sounds like uh, the people who go back and eat, come back a minute and come back, sounds like my cat. He does it all the time. <laughs> He's huge. Yeah. Just keep coming back eating. Big as Garfield. Yeah. Um, what measure do you use to decide which procedure is right for a certain patient? So we look at their BMI, we look at their, their, their actual weight, their age is a component as well, um, and then the health issues they have. Like I said, for the example of diabetes, you know, some people who have diabetes that's pretty well controlled, they can have any choice they want pretty much. 
But if you're getting to that uncontrolled diabetes stage, sometimes you need that stronger operation to helpfully get that diabetes under control. And like you said, as far as waking up and saying, oh, I'm recovered, there are some diabetics who can have the surgery on a Tuesday. By Wednesday, the diabetes is pretty much under control. They don't have to take any medication anymore. So it can be that powerful that quickly where they can get their operations under, you know, the operation can help them control their, their health issues that quickly. But the reality is, is that I try to tailor it to the patient. I say, well, what exactly are you looking for? If you come in and you tell me I want to look like, you know, Tyra Banks, I want to get down to a size zero, so I can't help you. I'm not a miracle worker. That's not what we do here. <laughs> oh, you keep it 100. That's, 100. No, that's just not, that's not even what we're looking at. We're trying to get you off these medications, get you from 350 pounds, maybe down to 200 pounds. So you're still going to be an overweight person, but you're going to be a healthier overweight person as opposed to being truly morbidly obese where you're struggling with all these health problems. And that's the thing. It's not about looks per se. It's about being healthy. Right. And looks, we have to looks get out are, of that vanity. Looks are good too, though. Don't get me wrong. I got some beautiful patients. They come up in here. It's amazing how much of a, a change in their in, in their outlook and the way that they feel about themselves. You know, you always hear about people who, who sometimes will lose weight and they're not so sure they still look good. I tell you, here in Atlanta, that's not a problem. These, these patients come in here looking spectacular. And it's just amazing how much of a change in their, like I said, everything, you know, because a lot of times you may not, you know, you and I may not recognize it because we're, you know, pretty good, good shape now. But people who struggle with obesity are, have lived with that, that extra weight for a long time. So for them, um, they get the little smirks. The little kids may look at them in the grocery store. People are, you know, um, criticizing them or thinking of it. When they see them ordering some food at a restaurant, they're thinking, oh, these people, you know, look at, this, look at how much food she's getting. So for them to be able to live comfortably in their own skin is something that is new to them, and it's amazing how well they do. I'm going to take one more question from the audience, and then we're going to yeah. book it up. Sure. Uh, are there after effects years later that patients have to be concerned about or just keep an eye on? Most definitely, most definitely. Um, whenever you have a little tiny stomach, like the ones that I was talking about with the sleeve or the bypass, you have to be really careful what you put in your stomach. So certain medications, I usually say, are off limits to patients who've had bariatric surgery because they have a risk for having ulcers or having problems. Um, because of the bypass and all the intestinal rerouting, I always tell patients there's a risk that you can have intestinal problems, you know, digestive issues, basically. So if you go out to eat and you get some bad guacamole, that's Pepe's fault, okay? He, he, he poisoned you. But if you have gastric bypass, you got to be careful. It may not be food poisoning. It may actually be something else going on. You need to go see your doctor, make sure you check up. So the most common things that we see, though, really and truly are the vitamin deficiencies. Patients are doing great. With 250, 300 pounds, get down to 160, look great, feel spectacular, exercising, eating great. But if they stop taking all those vitamins, their, their body still can't absorb 100% of what they need, so they can end up having some serious vitamin deficiencies. So that's why I was telling patients, it's pretty much a lifelong re recommendation that you have to take these vitamins to make sure you're getting everything that your body needs. I did say that was the last question, but somebody asked a great question in the comments. So I just want to know, do you ever turn people away from the surgery? Like they think that they need the surgery, but you recommend that they just do something else besides having the surgery? And if so, what would that be? What would be the reason? Yeah, that's a good question. Excellent question. The reality is it's hard. Some people are just not good candidates because of either um, their weight. They may not, either they're too big or they're too little. Sometimes mm -hmm. people think they need weight loss surgery. I'm like, you're only 40 pounds over where you're supposed to be. Hey, let's get you on a really good, healthy eating plan. I don't like to use the diet word. I say eating plan, get you on a good exercise program, and next thing you know, we can get those 40 pounds off and get close to, you know, get to where you need to be. Uh, for the folks that are really, really big, sometimes we need to have them lose some weight before they can even have surgery. So same idea. We put them on an eating plan. We put them on an exercise program. Try to get them down to a more manageable weight so that they can be safer to have the operation without any complications. But we do also extensive psychological testing, like you sort of you know, hinted at earlier. Some people, if you do I have a history of binge eating, they're not the best candidates because they have a high risk of potentially causing some damage to their stomachs afterwards. So mm. eating disorders, uh, people with certain genetic problems who predispose them to weight gain, they may not, may not be great candidates as well. Uh, your previous surgical history, if you've had lots of operations, it can make it a little bit more challenging. Those are a little bit, you know, few or far between, but the, the ones that I really worry about are the people who have psychological concerns that no matter what surgery we do, like they say, you can't stop what's going on above the mouth, right? So your brain is above your mouth. You have to make sure you've addressed those issues. If you're eating because you were abused as a child, me doing a surgery on your stomach is not going to stop that, that sort of relationship where you comfort yourself through eating. 
So you got to work with a psychologist. You know what I mean? You got to work with a psychologist. Let's get through those issues first. And then we can help you with your eating, you know, how you do with your weight loss. But you got to work on those problems as well. Now, that's amazing because I've been preaching on uh, another conversation, mental and physical health. Just like you go to the dentist and one problem here could mess with your heart. One problem there could mess with your hip. One yep. problem here, you know, it's all connected. It is. So, I just want to button things up and say, guys, just uh, be your own advocate for your health. Have a great relationship with your doctors, and you start there. It, even just something as simple as walking, because that's what I normally tell people too, doctor. Yeah. They're saying, oh, I can't go to the gym. I can't afford a membership. Just even walking up and down in your yard. Get doing some soup the- cans. Get some soup right. cans. <laughs> whatever you can do. Exercises in your chair. Whatever you can do. Yeah. Be creative. Yeah. Do some stretching. You know, yeah. just do what you can do. That's the most important thing. Um, before we end this, do you have anything you feel that you need to say that you would like to give some advice or anything before we close this out? Um, just really and truly don't know that you don't have to do it on your own. I mm-hmm. think that there are more and more doctors who are recognizing that obesity is a chronic problem and that, you know, there are people out there who specialize in, in this, like myself. You know, here in the Atlanta market, there's probably about eight or nine different bariatric practices that are really good, you know, reputable practices that would help you in that process. But wherever you are in the world, I think you can find a good health, you know, a healthy um, weight loss program that can help you. It's not going to be easy. It is not a quick fix. You will work harder than you ever have in your life, but it's going to be worth it in the long run. But don't feel like you have to do it on your own. That's the problem. You know, I mean, people are like, oh, I can't, you won't even take the first step if you think it's that hard. But at least if you have someone walking with you, come on, let's take that first step together. That's what our motto is here. Let me help you through the process. And I'm, I guarantee you, you're going to be successful. Would you like to tell anybody of uh, your location or where they could find you if they would like to be a patient of yours? If you want sure, to sure. So um, we are in Marietta, Georgia, which is just about 10, 15 miles outside of Atlanta. Um, I'm at Wellstar Kennestone Hospital. Mm-hmm. Uh, our website is www.mariettabariatrics.com. And I can post it on here later on. Or I can link it to you if you like, Kara, to put it on your site. Um, we have online seminars, so folks can go in there and, um, you know, watch a lot of this information we talked about and get a lot of research. I find that a lot, most bariatric patients are very, very well educated by the time they come to see me because they've done a lot of research. They, they know somebody. Aunt so-and-so had an operation. Sister so-and-so from across the street had right. an operation. Let's talk to them and figure out what's good for you. Um, but just know that there's, there's help available to you. If you need it, reach out. We'll be here for you. Well, again, let me say this. Dr. Fritz John Pierre. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so very much for joining us today. And, brother, we thank you for serving the community. I'm so proud of any uh, black person I see that becomes a daughter. Uh, I'm proud of you. Keep doing your work. Thank you. uh, I'm going to edit this video. I will put some information where people can find you so they can reach out to you. And again, thank you. Uh, God bless you. Thank you, audience, for tuning in. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. You too.